Oh, thou my muse, a good old Scotch drink. Whether through wimpling worm thou jink, or richly brune, ream o'er the brink in glorious fame. Inspire me, till I lisp and wink to sing thy name. Whiskey, the inspiration of the poet Rabbi Byrne, of the Scots people, and now the world. Scottish landscape and refined by the secret knowledge of the Highlander, a dram has for centuries been the only way to mark the milestones of life. A toast to the promise of the future at a wedding, a celebration at the birth of a long-awaited child, or a fond farewell to a much-loved friend. The world may be drinking whiskey, but only the Scots can make it. This is not just by regulation and the law of men, but a simple statement of truth. Scottish whiskey can never be made anywhere else in the world. Only here, in this northern land of glens and forests, of soft sunshine and arctic cold, crystal waters and ancient granite, can the real thing be created. A spirit that embodies the tempest of thunder and the sweetness of innocence. A drink that mysteriously holds within its golden light an essence of the astounding beauty of this land, and in precious fluid the history of an ancient people, their trials and sorrows, but also their laughter and song, their hard-won wisdom. T'will make your courage rise, T'will make a man forget his woe, T'will heighten all his joy, T'will make the widow's heart to sing, Though the tear were in her eye. Its very name proves the hold that whiskey has on the imagination and arts of the Scots. It's from the old Gaelic, Yishkabea, meaning water of life. A simple phrase that sums up the magic alchemy of this spirit. No mere drink, but part of the miracle of our very existence. The earliest chroniclers of whiskey's powers clearly saw it as life-giving. The English, and so perhaps skeptical, historian Hollinshed believed in 1577 that it cureth the hydropsy, keepeth the head from whirling, the heart from swelling, the sinews from shrinking, and the bones from aching. Truly, it is a sovereign liquor, if it be orderly taken. It's only natural to want to find the origins of whiskey, to seek a date, a place perhaps, or a name. We have clues. In the retreating snows of the last ice age, Pictish people lived in Scotland. They left no writing, but as the climate warmed, they left their mark upon the landscape. In strange ceremonies, they drank a brew to worship the gods of the mountains, rivers, and trees. The Scots of today still feel that reverence. For many years, it was believed that St. Patrick brought the secret to the Scots in the fourth century from Ireland. His first Irish convert was a Celtic chieftain, the one that had kidnapped him in a pirate raid many years before. The raid was on St. Patrick's birthplace, Dumbarton, on the great Scottish River Clyde. Arguments will go on forever, but whiskey makes its debut into the written word five centuries ago. The King's Exchequer Rolls for 1494 record that a Friar John Cor has eight bowls of malt, that's about 1800 weight, for the making of aqua vitae, the fancy Latin name for water of life. In the following centuries, whiskey making was to become a favorite Highland pastime. Every croft had a small still. In 1657, a new official knocked on crofters' doors, the Gager, a government-sponsored man charged with the measuring how much whiskey was being made. Naturally suspicious, the stillmen kept their activities dark. After all, it's but a short step to tax what is fine. 
They were perfectly right, and Rabbi Burns had something to say about it. Tell them we hae the chief direction, Scotland and me's in great affliction, ere sin they laid that cursed restriction on aqua vitae. Despite the danger, Pete continued to be stoked up in fires under many a highland still. Cattle drovers, what? forever travelling the highways of the north, taking beasts to the market of the lowlands, what? became connoisseurs of the best croft to stop the night at and enjoy a homemade dram to what? keep the cold out. Many of their wayside rests continue to make whiskey today on the right side of the law and in bigger stills. That whiskey and politics are tightly bound together in the story of Scotland was never better seen than in the Treaty of Union between England and Scotland of 1707. The Articles of Union specifically mention malt and promise that it will not be taxed in Scotland as it already was south the border. By 1713 this promise is broken and a malt tax was imposed. Angry mobs rioted to cries of free malt as the army was brought in to quell the disturbances. This feeling of betrayal may have fueled the Jacobite rebellions of 1715 and 1745 which unsuccessfully tried to restore a Catholic Stuart monarch to the throne, Bonnie Prince Charles. Making whiskey now was an act of defiance to the English and their government, and became the way a Highlander retained a sense of self-respect. As Rabbi Burns rightly said, freedom and whiskey gang together. Seventeen forty-five was the darkest hour. On the tragic field of Culloden, a final holy mass was celebrated. Instead of bread and wine. The priest used oat cakes and whiskey. Despite everything, the natural spirit of the Highlander won through. Like their tartans and the Gallic tongue, distilling went underground. Smuggling illegal but excellent quality whiskey became a common profession. The demand from thirsty Newtown Edinburgh and even from England became insatiable. Sympathetic and sensible crofters said nothing when a consignment passed in the night, sometimes on up to 50 heavily laden pack horses. All along the whiskey trail, smugglers carried their precious cargo to the discerning drinkers willing to pay for genuine Highland malt. Every step of the way, they feared discovery by the excisemen. Whiskey was the only thing that kept food in the mouths of many a Highland family. The official statistical accounts for the year 1796 found that distilling is almost the only method of converting our victual into cash. Whiskey may in fact be called our staple commodity. Battles between smugglers and excisemen could be bloody and even fatal. You had to be willing to die for the water of life or the tax on it. Malcolm Gillespie, a famous exciseman in the 1790s, could, on his deathbed, point to 42 serious wounds received from desperate and determined smugglers in his 28 years of service. Scotland's national poet Robert Burns saw life from both sides of the fence. He was an exciseman for seven years, but in a famous ballad, his sympathies lie with the wrong side of the law. The duke a fiddle through the tune and he dance a war with excise man And elk a white cries all mahoon, I wish you luck with the prize man The deal's a war, the deal's a war, the deal's a war with excise man He stands a war, he stands a war, he stands a war with excise man When a reward was offered to anyone disclosing an illicit still they would turn in a worn bit of their still, claim they'd found it on the hillside, and then go marching home with a five pounds bounty. Ideal for investing in a new pot still. In one year in the early 1800s, 14,000 illegal whiskey stills were found by the excisemen. How many more did they miss? In 1823, the final death knell for the romantic and colourful but illegal whisky makers and smugglers was rung. The Illicit Distillation Scotland Act was passed. With its stiff penalties and tight regulation, the modern era of whisky was brought into being. 
The first brave man to go legitimate and buy a license was one George Smith of Glenlivet. At the time, he was regarded as a traitor, but he made a wise decision and reaped the benefits, as we have. The 19th century saw more and more shining new distilleries being built by proud, respectable families. Whiskey quality rose, especially as the practice of aging the spirit was taken up. The old crofter could never afford to wait for his barrels to mature in the way that the secure distilleries could. Now we have a toast in Scotland. Here we say Slangy Bar. Now, in the late 20th century, whiskey has become the world's premier deluxe spirit. Its name a watchword for quality and distinction. Single malts from single distilleries have never been so much in demand. So, what is it that people find in the glowing glass? It's a distillation of all that is good and wild about this land. Ever-changing like the seasons, yet still as the granite of the Cairngorms. As the life in whiskey starts to work on you, it's possible to feel the spirit of the old days. Pictish wonder at the land about us, Celtic mysticism and wisdom, and the wiliness, the zest for freedom and adventure that mark the illicit stillman and the smuggler. Spain, a great valley carved by the fastest flowing river in the British Isles, the rushing torrent of the Spain. Here, foaming down the Skelvy rocks in twisting strength therein, there high my boiling torrent smokes, wild roaring o'er a lynn. Here in the ancient past, whiskey and the people who created it were born. Today, this is the last wilderness in Europe, protected and cherished. Home to the soaring golden eagle, the shy red deer, and the last remnant of the original Caledonian pine. This singular place is the cradle of Ushkabea. The meltwater of the snow-capped peaks is pure. It rushes down from the granite through the peat, gathering vital trace elements. Peat itself, built up over thousands of years from seasons of sparse vegetation, brings an aroma on burning that is unmatched. Finally, the barley. Hardy, growing in tough condition, it gains an inner strength, a sweetness not found in softer grains. So, in a remote area of a tiny country, everything comes together for creating treasure, the water of life. Since the days of the ancients, alchemists have dreamt of turning base metals into precious gold. But in the highlands of Scotland, for centuries, certain individuals have known the secret of fusing the elements, fire, earth, air, and water, to create liquid gold, whiskey. The art is bred in the bone of the Highlander, who knows the ancient landscape, feels the natural forces at work, and can bring their power to a noble grain, barley. The fertile coastal plains round the mountainous heart of Scotland are the grain store of the whisky maker. From the Murray coast and the rich fields of Aberdeenshire and the Mans, with their long northern summer evenings, comes the golden grain that Burns called John Barley. The sultry suns of summer came, and he grew thick and strong. His heed wheel armed with pointed spears that no one should him wrong. They obtained a weapon, long and sharp, and cut him by the knee, then tied him fast upon a cart like rogue for forgery. So the harvested John Barleycorn begins the long journey to a thirsty world. The first stage on that journey is molting.
The Maltman, places carefully selected barley in tanks of pure water called steeps, there to gather up moisture for two or three days. Drained, it's then traditionally laid out thickly on the stone floors of the malt house. Slowly, in the moist, dim atmosphere, the barley comes to life. Sprouting rootlets appear, and the vital starches in the ear become soluble. For up to seven days, the maltman watches carefully, and every eight hours, turns the grain on the stone floors of the malt house. Years of experience tell him when the perfect moment has been reached, and then the germination is stopped in the heat of the malt kiln, always fired with aromatic peat from the bogs around the distilleries. Like the spring water used, the peat imparts something of the spirit of the wild land to the gentler virtues of the barley. As it's turned on grids high above the furnaces, the grain becomes crisp and toasty in the peat smoke, and ready for the next stages, mashing and brewing. The wholesome malt is dressed by removing the rootlets and any impurities, then coarsely ground in the mill. In the past, it was driven by water, hence one of the reasons for distilleries romantic sites by fast flowing burns and rivers. The ground malt, or grist, is now ready to be mashed with hot water. The two are left in silent communion in a huge vessel, the mash tun. The cloudy, insipid gruel is transformed into wort, a clear, sweet fluid full of the dissolved sugars of the barley. The wort goes onto the wash bags, leaving a rich malt residue. The canny farmer distillers of the past found out that it makes an excellent cattle food. In the wash bags, the busy energy of yeast is added to the cool wort for the next stage, fermentation. The liquid starts to seethe and bubble as the tiny yeast organism, which needs oxygen to breathe, manufactures it from the sugars. A happy byproduct of this fermentation is alcohol. A frothy head forms and the liquid seems likely to boil over, but the brewer switches it down. It's done automatically now, but in the past men had to work hard with long birch sticks to beat the foam back. The temperature rises as the yeast works, but gradually the fierce life in the washback quiets down. The fermentation is a stage where things can go mysteriously wrong, but with luck and the skill of the brewer, the wash now contains about 7% alcohol. This presence of alcohol now brings the excise man into the process, as the liquid must be kept under lock and key in the wash receivers, ready for the fiery alchemy of distillation. The mighty stillhouse is the part of the distillery that captures the imagination with its gargantuan gleaming copper pot stills. Elegant and magical, they transform, purify, and embolden the base elements into the proud spirit. To the stillmen who watch and tend them, pot stills possess a life and character of their own. They must get to know their vagaries and strengths to get the best from them.
The art of coppersmithing still continues on Speyside. In the fiery workshops, pot stills are made and repaired with the sweat of many a skilled brow, the design refined over centuries. It's a technically demanding art, but superstition comes into it too. When a still, or any part of one, comes to the end of its life, it must be replaced with an identical one. The coppersmith must even remake all the tiny dents, just in case they are the source of that intangible something that makes a sweet still. Scottish whiskey is distilled not once, but twice. The first larger wash still is slowly heated. The alcohol is vaporized up through the graceful swan neck to be condensed again by constantly running cold water. It then runs into the spirit safe. This first distillate is an oily liquid, still unfit to drink, called low wines, and containing about 17% alcohol. The stillman is in charge, armed with a knowledge often passed from father to son across the generations, but also with a feel that can never be taught, but is born. The heat of the still must be right. Too cool and not enough alcohol and essential oils come through. Too hot and the wash may boil furiously and disastrously through the condenser, ruining not only that run of whiskey, but the finely wrought still itself. Unlike the patent coffee still, used to distill other grain spirits, Highland malt is always distilled in single batches in traditional pot stills. For up to eight hours, the stillman must watch anxiously as the trickle of low wine becomes a steady flow, leaving behind the spent wash. The tricky procedure must now be done all over again in the second, smaller, spirit still. The low wines gradually warm, then simmer as the stillman waits with a growing sense of anticipation for the first drops of spirit to come through the swan neck. This foreshot is discarded as too strong and filled with bitter oils. The last part of the flow is also avoided. These faints are weak and would spoil the clarity and strength of the final whiskey. So we have come to a moment of truth in the making of barley into fine malt whiskey. All the stages of malting and grinding, mashing and brewing, and the first distillation have brought the spirit to this mysterious and critical moment when science and all the new technical innovation desert the scene. Now the stillman must decide when to take the flow. He can test it by dropping clear water into a sample to see if it turns cloudy, and can use the technology of temperature gauges and hydrometers, but they are only a guide. Only one man in thousands, after years of experience, can take this decision. It's a moment to hold your breath. A silent, private time when the culmination of generations of whiskey making all the hopes and dreams of the highlands come together to choose the perfect spirit. After such an intricate, delicate, and perhaps even miraculous transformation of the fruit of the earth, barley, now comes the final, and some would say, knowing human nature, the most difficult part, simply sitting back and waiting. By law, before it can be called whiskey, the barley spirit must be aged for at least three years. The clear young spirit is too brash, too sharp. It must have its edges smooth, its heart mellowed, and it must gradually, almost imperceptibly, gain the color that sets whiskey apart. According to the American author O. Henry, good whiskey has the color of gold is clear as glass and shines after dark as if the sunshine were still in it. To mature a fine whiskey takes a fine barrel. 
No fancy modern materials can match the qualities found in an oak cask. The mysterious reaction between the noble oak and the spirit gives body and flavor. Within the cask, it's protected and safe from tainting, yet the living spirit can breathe. A cooper or barrel maker from the past would be glad to see that the ancient and honorable craft has been passed down the generations. The barrel, with its shaped staves held watertight only by the encircling girdles of iron, is one of man's triumphs of engineering and art. The king of casks is one that has originally held fine Spanish Oloroso sherry. This gifts to the whiskey a marvelous golden glow. Over the years, the spirit matures. Time rolls by. But in the bonded warehouses of the distilleries, time loses its meaning. The outside world is forgotten. A whiskey is laid down, and a boy at that moment has to become a man before the whiskey has reached the fullest maturity, perhaps in 15 years. Once a week, the barrels are checked. Footsteps echo down the cathedral-like aisles and the steady work of whiskey, wood, and time goes on. It has been estimated that lying quietly in the bonded warehouses of Scotland is whiskey worth more than all the gold reserves of the Bank of England. Truly, whiskey is the wealth of this nation. This treasure is watched over carefully by the excise service and the warehouse staff but it's said that they are not the only ones. The kindly spirits of ancient Caledonia are there taking care of the whiskey, and maybe they add their touch of magic to each cask. Silently, and without anyone noticing, a small proportion of the whiskey disappears. It evaporates away into the clear mountain air. This is known by the old distillers as the angel's share gladly given to the spirits and fairy folk for their help and inspiration. The remote realm of Highland malt whiskey may be small, but it's studded with riches. Around 50 distilleries sit on the banks of the Spey or her tributaries, each jealously guarding the secret of their whiskey's unique flavor. Adam Bofer, Donald Don, we are his tante wallops on. He's a lad that's worth a known for he might seal in whiskey. When he was young and in his prime, he loaded up on a lassie fine. She jilted him and I and signed his only love is whiskey. A bunch of rags is all his bras, his hilly wake had frecht the cross, his dirty face and clarty paws would fill the bio whiskey. As a sarky husband in fairly warm to skin and bin, love him lighter and it's lame with fleecy bald and frisky. So here's a health to Donald Don, we are his tanter wallops on. May he never lack a scorn for muck and heel and whiskey. It's here on dramatically beautiful Speyside that you can travel the world's only malt whiskey trail. 
eight signposted distilleries have joined together and are willing to throw open their doors to share just a few of their secrets. You'll find a warm welcome and a dram. Each has its own story to tell, graced with remarkable, hard-working and visionary men and women. You'll find strange tales and extraordinary happenings. The Whiskey Trail starts in the borough of Keith, mentioned in the charter of King William the Lion in 1195. It sits on the boundary between the highlands and the rich Murray Plains. Strathyla is fondly regarded as the oldest working distillery in the highlands, founded by George Taylor, the local postmaster and banker, in 1786. For much of the 19th century, the Longmore family were in charge. William was a progressive farmer who, recognizing the distillery's dependence on the talented people of Keith, built a village hall and bowling green for their recreation. Strathyla also has a place in many people's hearts as the most attractive distillery. The characteristic pagoda-style roofline was created by Doig Ventilators, a great technical innovation of the 1870s, designed by Charles Doig, the architect of Elgin. Thankfully for so practical an item, they are an elegant addition to the landscape. As the distillery was expanded and rebuilt over the years, it was common practice to gather materials from nearby ruins. This is probably how a fascinating stone bearing the initials LMO came to be in the old granary wall. Lady Margaret Ogilvy was one of the great Ogilvy family who rebuilt nearby Milton Castle in around 1600. The most famous member of the family was John, martyred at Glasgow Cross in 1615 and elevated to sainthood by the Pope in 1976. Built by the River Isla, which till as recently as 1965 turned the 19th century water wheel, Strathyla gets its soft and pure water for brewing from the Broom Hill Spring. In the 12th and 13th centuries, Dominican and Cistercian monks considered it a holy well and knew it as Fons Bulliens, or Bubbling Fountain. But long before that, Pictish water kelpies were said to guard the sacred sweet water of Strathyla. Perhaps they still do. West now to a village officially founded in 1766, but as the ruins of the 12th century castle proved, Rothes was inhabited long before that. It was at Rothes, in the great storms of 1829, that the full destructive power of the River Spey was demonstrated. The torrent washed away many bridges and then burst its banks, flooding hundreds of acres in the plain of Rothes. A survivor of the time tells of seeing a collection of spinning wheels, chairs, cradles, tables, beds and chests of drawers floating on the water a pathetic indication of the ravages of swollen rivers. Many lost their lives. Glen Grant Distillery in Rothes was founded by two brothers, James and John Grant, who had a farm at nearby Dandaleith from about 1834. Like their neighbours, they did a bit of distilling on the sly, both to drink and to sell. They'd learned the art from their forefathers, all expert smugglers and distillers. The site the brothers chose was by the ever-flowing Cappadonic Well. This is still the only pure source for Glen Grand water. From the very beginning, James and John were keen to use any innovation in the making of their whiskey, and the tradition continues. Glen Grand has the distinction of being one of the few distilleries to use purifiers, 
which separate the heavier elements coming from the still before they've been through the condenser. James Grant, son of one of the founders, was a great game hunter in Africa. After one safari, he returned to Rothis with a black orphaned boy from Matabililand called Baiwe, who lived the rest of his life at the distillery and grew to be loved by many of the villagers. Every day, Grant would take a constitutional walk to the river, no doubt to consider the business of the day and enjoy the scenery. What better way to accompany such a precious moment than a small glass of his finest malt? Cunningly hidden on the way is a small safe. Byway had the sworn duty of making sure every day that a fresh supply was there and a glass ready. Further along the river, in a small cave, an extra cask was hidden. You can imagine the two men after many years, each with a key to the safe, sitting down for a quiet drink, no longer master and servant, but with a glass in hand, simply friend. Nestling at the foot of the Manor Hill in Nakando Parish is the third distillery along the Whiskey Trail, Kadu. On the Whitson of 1811, a 19-year lease was signed by John Cummings of Wester Elkies in Murrayshire on the farm of Kadau. John was a spirited man, convicted not once but three times of illicit distilling. Excisemen were frequent visitors to the house, but they were not always successful in catching the comings out. Once, Helen was distilling in the kitchen when the knock came at the door. Showing great calm, she dusted herself with flour and took yeast to the door to pretend to have been bread making. The yeast covered the smell of fermentation. While the excisemen sat down to refreshments, she ran out to hoist a red flag over the barn to warn neighbors of the gauges. In 1824, their lives became a little more relaxed as they took out a license to carry on their activities legally, shipping through Burghead to Leith and on to England where the fame of their whiskey had spread. Consequently, after John, their son Lewis ran the business until his death in 1872. His widow, Elizabeth, was a remarkable woman. Deciding to carry on the traditions of Cardau, whose whiskey was now known as Cardu, she ran the distillery herself, hiring and firing, doing the accounts, and taking pains to maintain quality. Among the select band of lady distillers, Elizabeth stands prominent. A hard businesswoman, her whiskey retains its soft, warm character. Elizabeth showed such acumen that in 1885 she was able to build a completely new distillery. The old apparatus was sold to one William Grant, who was about to set up in whiskey making, and we'll hear more of him later on the trail. In 1893, Elizabeth crowned the success of Cardu by marrying it to the Grant blenders, Johnny Walker and Sons, and placing her own son on the board. John Walker and Sons drove a road down the valley to persuade the new railways to run alongside Cardu and the nearby newly opened Tamdu in 1879 so their whiskey could travel to customers easily. It all makes you think that there's some truth in one of the legends of Cardu. As founder John Cummings' wife Helen was working late one night at the still, a wizened old woman came to the door begging. Helen took her in and offered her a bowl of their warming malt whiskey. The old woman was not what she seemed, but one of the fairy folk, a Celtic spirit of the past. As she eagerly gulped down the delicious spirit, she cried, Brew, wifey, brew, for you and yours will never want. Who are we to argue with the taste and prophecies of the spirits of ancient Caledonia? Just south of Cardu lies Tamdu Distillery. Its name in Gaelic means Little Black Hill. Most of the old established distilleries of Speyside had just one family or even one man as their founder. But Tamdu has a different origin. 
In the late 1890s, as the fame of Scotch whisky was spreading to an eager world, a group of local businessmen decided to open a distillery. The £19,200 was raised, and in 1897, the Tamdu Distillery Company was brought into being. The partners decided to build to very high specifications, despite problems. As the newspaper pointed out, the preparation of the water race was a work of very great difficulty, some hundreds of tons of rock having to be quarried, but the outlay both the engineers and the promoters considered advantageous. The consortium of bankers and businessmen saw their first cask filled on the 21st of July in 1897. Within a year, Tamdu whiskey was flowing freely and a roaring success. The founders were able to sell up to Highland distilleries, who to this day are in charge. Tamdu has the singular distinction of being the only Highland distillery continuing to malt all its own barley. It means they have control over buying the original grain and over the delicate process of malting. The back-breaking work for the maltmen was eased in the 1950s by the introduction of saladin boxes. These keep a steady temperature for the sprouting grain and mechanically turn it. Tamdu were pioneers in this innovation. During the Great Railway expansion of the late 19th century, by joining forces with nearby Kadu, Tamdu were able to get the line close to the distillery. For generations, until the beaching cuts of the 1960s, the whiskey train was a familiar sight on Speyside, carrying hundreds of casks south. The old railway station was saved. It now lives again as the Tamdu Visitor's Centre. Within its charming wooden walls, you can toast the golden age of steam with the fruit of whiskey's golden age, Tamdu Malt. Next stop is in Dufton, where there are more distilleries per head of population than anywhere else in the world. An old rhyme goes, Rome was built on seven hills, Dufton was built on seven stills. Perhaps the most famous of these stills are at Glenfiddich. Legend has it that the founder, William Grant, born in 1839, was told to make whiskey here by an old priest. He knew that the water from the Robbie Doo Spring was pure and inexhaustible. William had been an apprentice shoemaker, then the manager of a lime works, before joining the Mortlach distillery. He stayed there 20 years, eventually becoming manager. His chance to set up himself and try to produce whiskey he could proudly put his name to came in 1886. Elizabeth Cumming of Cardew was rebuilding. So in the late summer of 1886, William handed over the price of £120 for the old equipment. His whole investment in Glenfiddich was £775, money carefully saved and wisely spent. He saw his first whisky produced on the suitably festive day of Christmas 1887. William and his five sons were fascinating men. Education was nearly as highly prized to them as whiskey. One became a lawyer, another a teacher, while the other three worked as stillman, maltman, and tonroom man for their father. A tale is told of how an inland revenue inspector arrived to do the accounts of Glenfiddich. He wondered why there were Latin and mathematical textbooks in the working areas of the plant. He was amazed to find that the men making the spirits were now and then snatching a moment to widen their learning. 
The educated and shrewd Grants are one of the few founding families still to be running their distilleries today. William Grant died in 1923 at the ripe old age of 83. In 1955, the distillery was rebuilt and a few years later, Glenfiddich, for long the heart of the blend, Standfast, was again launched as a single malt. It's normal practice for whiskey makers to send the spirits all over the country to be bottled. But Glenfiddich prefer to do it themselves, right here on Speyside, where the whiskey was born and matured. This makes it the only Highland malt whiskey to be bottled at its own distillery, using a single source of natural spring water. The future of this family company is certain. The descendants of William Grant are determined to remain independent and Scottish, committed to retaining the old traditional methods of production. Where the River Arn joins the rushing torrent of the Spey at the foot of Ben Rinnes is the distillery of Glen Farkless at Ballindallough. Its future and fortunes have been watched over by another Grant family. The story starts in 1836, when a farmer, Robert A., applied for one of the new licenses to distill whiskey on his farm. His was rather a small operation, and it wasn't until his death in 1865 that things started to get going. John Grant, from Blairfindy, bought the farm and distillery for £511. A tough man who made his own way in life. His ancestors had bravely carried arms in the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion for Bonnie Prince Charlie. John's son, John and George, inherited their father's skills and enthusiasm for whiskey making and carried on the tradition. Like any family, the Grants had their sad and troubled times. John and George both died young and within a year of each other. Again, a widow was forced to run the business till her sons were of an age to take over. For a time, the company was in partnership with a leaf firm of blenders, Pattison and Delder, who did much to spread the fame of Glen Farkless until they collapsed in debt. Glen Farkless could have been ruined, and many families would have given up at this point. The Grants are made of sterner stuff, though. Today, they carry on the tradition set in motion by John Grant over a century ago. The soft water for Glen Farkless comes straight from a secret well on the mountain of Ben Rinnes, glowering above the distillery. You can taste the whiskey made with that water in the elegant setting of the Glen Farkless Visitor Center, decorated with antique paneling from the ocean liner Empress of Australia. It's also here at Ballindalloch that you can watch the time-honored practice of filling the oak casks before they are laid down in the bonded warehouses to mature and mellow. To take you back in time, Glen Farkless offer the strongest malt whiskey on the market, their special Glen Farkless 105. It is cask strength spirit, as drunk in the lawless days of the 17 and 1800s, a taste of tradition not for the faint-hearted. Now the whiskey trail heads south for the last two stops. The Smith family was first recorded as having settled in the wild and desolate area of Glenlivet in 1715, at the time of the first Jacobite rising. Generations of the Smith family have drawn water from Josie's well to make the Glenlivet. By all accounts, of the many who distilled in the Glen, they were the best, and down the years, Glenlivet whiskey became known as a superior drought. The Glenlivet was one of the first distilleries to get a new license issued under the Act of 1823. The illicit distillers felt it was a traitorous action. 
At length, in 1824, I, George Smith, who was then a robust young fellow and not easily flag it, determined to chance it. The outlook was an ugly one, though. The Laird of Abalawa had presented me with a pair of hair-trigger pistols, and they were never out of my belt for years. The Glenlivet has one other distinction, and that's the the in the name. As it became famous, others wanted to borrow some of the glory, and so claimed their whiskey was from Glenlivet. The valley became known as the longest glen in Scotland, as distillers stretched its boundaries. The Smith family took a case to the highest courts in the land to protect their good name, and were delighted to win the right to say that only their Glenlivet was the Glenlivet. A small distinction, but an important one. If the Glenlivet distillery represents the long and rich tradition of whiskey making, then the future is surely embodied by a relative youngster in the game of whiskey, Tam Navulin, and just a short distance along the valley of Glenlivet. Set in a beautiful secluded spot, Tam Navulin is reached by the road south through Glenrinnis, past the heights of Meikle Conval and Ben Rinnis. Its romantic name comes from the old water mill, which now makes a rustic visitor's centre. In Gaelic, it means the mill on the hill, where once soft highland wool from the sheep grazing all around was carded. It was in 1966 that the site was chosen as the place to build one of Speyside's newer distilleries, and it's a shining example of the very best in technical innovation. However, Tam Navulin is a part of a long tradition. The lifeblood of the Highlanders' ancient art still flows here along with the whiskey. It's too easy to say that the longer a distillery is established, the better claim it has to quality. But whiskey does not and should not live in a museum. It's a lively art that needs to be nurtured and encouraged. A place like Tamnavulin is the inheritor of generations of wisdom and the seedbed of future knowledge in a vigorous industry. Anyway, you've always got to remember that whiskey has been made here for hundreds of years. The names we think of as old established were young ones. So Tamnavulin, like whiskey itself, will be around for another few centuries and will soon earn a place in the history books. The Whiskey Trail takes you on a marvellous journey through Scotland's most dramatic and wild scenery. And it takes you on a journey through time. From the dawn of the Age of Man, with its tales of water kelpies and fairy folk, through the holy wells of the monasteries, the battles lost and won, the remarkable hard-working times of the Crofner and distillers, to the dangerous yet romantic era of the smuggler, and up to the present day when whiskey is the world's favorite spirit. Whiskey is the pride of a small nation. Scotland's gift to the peoples of the earth. A distillation of pure water from the granite of the north, the wild fragrance of the heather and the peat, and the golden grain of the fertile plains. Wishkabea. The water of life. The last word should go to the Ettrick Shepherd, the Scots writer James Hogg. In a lifetime of enthusiastic investigation, he eventually came to this conclusion about whiskey. If a body could just find out the exact and proper proportion and quantity that ought to be drunk every day and keep to that, I verily trow that he might live forever without dying at all, and the doctors and the kirkyards would go out of fashion. Slanch, if ah.